I'd just like to introduce uh, the, the panel itself as well as the speakers. So COVID-19 created a multifaceted global crisis that has challenged business leaders to rethink their operational models amid the new realities imposed by the pandemic. Meanwhile, new opportunities have emerged to leverage virtual work as a viable option to ensure business continuity among COVID-19 related restrictions. This panel will explore the opportunities which have emerged from the pandemic, identifying capacities and skills gaps needed to facilitate transitions to employment. We have uh, four speakers on the panel. Our colleague uh, is having a bit of technical difficulties joining in at the moment. However, we hope to, to have him in soon. Uh, Mr. Daniel Anarose, who is the CB CEO of Manobi Africa. Uh, Dr. Daniel Anarose is founder of uh, Manobi Africa, an African group which exploits technical innovations to drive transformations in Africa's agriculture and water sectors, harnessing data intelligence inside business solutions which reduce investment risks and orchestrate quicker economic and social returns. I'd also like to introduce our colleague, Wambui Kinya, Vice President of Partner Engineering at Andela. Wambui Kinya is the Vice President um, at Andela, the premier talent network that connects companies with vetted remote engineers in, in emerging markets. Andela has built its network of high-performing distributed engineer teams by investing in Africa's most talented software engineers. I'd also like to introduce our colleague, Sylvia Kunkebe, Lead Transitions at the MasterCard Foundation. Sylvia is a school to work transitions professional who designs programs to equip young people with employable skills while facilitating their transition from education into employment and entrepreneurship across Africa. She led the execution of a remote internship program that helped businesses across Africa in order to manage early COVID restrictions and challenges. Likewise, I'd like to introduce Dr. Judine Preddy, director of the Work Learn Institute at the University of Waterloo. The Work Learn Institute uh, has been conducting research on the experience of the cooperative education student experience as they transition to remote work terms. Judine will be sharing insights gained through three research studies on the ways in which the transition to remote work has been successful for students and some of the challenges they've faced and differences they've noted. Uh, as such, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to invite Wambui to begin her presentation. Uh, we will then open the floor for uh, various questions uh, once the uh, panelists have had an opportunity to speak, and then we can go into a, a deeper discussion. So, Wambui, please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for the opportunity um, to share. Um, so, I'll start off by speaking to one second. Um, sort of from the practitioner's perspective, this is a company that has been scaling in terms of its efforts of engaging employment for youth in Africa um, while preparing them as long-term embedded team members for um, over 300 companies um, across the world. But before we get into sort of how Andela has done it and what our experiences have been, I wanted to maybe touch a little bit on this concept of remote work and what does this really mean and why must we take it seriously today? Because even as recently as the beginning of this year, the concept of remote teams was very daunting for many CEOs and CTOs that we talked to. There were many reasons for them to prefer office-based teams, including the ability to run high-performing, high-functioning teams, and certainly the ease and comfort of building team safety and trust required to work together formally and informally um, to resolve problems, but also to brainstorm new concepts. Before COVID, 13% of engineering teams were fully remote. That number has now increased to 74%. According to a study by Boston Consulting Group, about 66% of engineering teams that they polled believe they will continue to allow remote work after the threat of COVID has subsided. This means that irrespective of where you and your companies are in thinking about remote work, you will at best be thinking about a hybrid model, even when things subside. So as leaders within your organizations, you have to rethink your culture and your operational approach to support remote or even better, becoming remote first. So what do I mean by remote first? This is not an exercise in intuition, but really it's a design philosophy to ensure you maximize culture, performance, structure, and productivity. And what does Andela know about being remote first? Um, as a network that connects vetted and remote talent with global engineering companies, we've learned a lot over the last six and a half years. 
And Dala helps companies build remote and distributed teams quickly and cost effectively so that they can ship faster. However, until recently, we were still co-located in about seven cities across Africa and the US. It was always in our roadmap to become remote first, but, but I guess certainly because of the model that initiated Andala's instantiation, we really did depend on in-person and really invested in really awesome campuses in at least um, four countries. Um, so the pandemic simply accelerated this strategy, but it was always in our plans. So I should mention that another way that we've also learned how to engage with youth um, towards skills and employment was in an effort to cultivate a broader network of talent across Africa. This was through the Andela Learning Community, which we started about three years ago. By leveraging partnerships with technology companies like Google, Facebook, um, and working with talent development companies like Pluralsight and Udacity, We've created an open source environment for technologists to learn, engage, and innovate with different programming languages and frameworks in agile, remote, and distributed teams. This community has grown to over 80,000 learners across 50 countries and a great platform for Andela to learn more about youth in Africa, but certainly the culture and community of, the, of their remote working teams. Some lessons that we learned. When the internet became our headquarters, we became more open to hiring and seeking talent across all of Africa and beyond. And it gave us a talent liquidity and an access to more youth in a way that we previously were quite constrained. While internet and power connectivity has increased in most major cities in Africa, it was really critical at the individual person in their home desk um, ability to have reliable access. So access is one thing, but reliable access was the other. This often meant um, partnerships with service providers, but also having to really pay up and invest in additional stipends for our employees. The pandemic, more so than working remote, also brought on additional stresses, and we needed to ensure that the culture of caring was really emphasized, whether this was additional forgiveness and support for caregivers or for young people who were working now within the context of their family homes, but also the increase in the working hours and what was required to give additional medical and psychological support given the outbreak. And while we transitioned quickly and effectively, there were bumps and we had to really practice and put to practice a lot of our own thought leadership on remote first ways of working. That that we have seen in our client engagements or our customer engagements drive better outcomes than, in the, than the in-person equivalent. And I'll speak to this next. So there's a lot Andela has learned and shaped into thought leadership on remote first practices, given our work helping hundreds of engineering teams to think about how they not only onboard, but set their remote teams for long-term embedded success. We've also learned a lot working with clients like GitHub, Cloudflare, and Envision, who have designed standards and mature remote first practices. As an example, Envision, one of our customers, has proven that it is not only possible as a 100% remote organization, but also necessary to become remote first, to be remote first, to take highly collaborative processes like ideation and design to build an even better product. This took being intentional about their team's culture to have a balance between productivity, health, and fun. So to speak a little bit about how might you be thinking about this in the, in, the, uh, in the construct of your organizations. Remember earlier I said it really does require some um, creating some design and being intentional in how you approach it. With a COVID lockdowns, most companies and perhaps some of yours are simply in the replication phase. So standing meetings that you had in person simply moved to remote. And now there's an overemphasis, an overemphasis on live in-person meetings, which having to do that every day, all day, really becomes quite tenuous at best and not necessarily increasing productivity. To evolve, the design starts to apply. You need to think about the structures and processes that must evolve to benefit your teams culturally and operationally, but also have an impact on your performance. But and also gives you competitive advantage. Formalization is the implementation part. This is where you would have developed a remote work philosophy and would have embedded it into your organizational culture. 
So thinking about how do your values and the ways of working rely on in-person discourse versus if it were all remote. Maturity is where some of our clients are. This is where you start to see the competitive advantage. And oftentimes this is when your team is working better as a remote and asynchronous team than an in-person team. So what does it take to be able to shift through these stages? Mindset, moving from popping in or walking in to, um, to a model that is more self-service and really one that is a shared learning mindset. So where and how do you share information so others can access it when they need it? How do you build the organizational muscle for over communicating and seeking feedback? From a culture perspective, how do you move from water cooler interactions and in-person culture building? So the barbecues, happy hours, to building remote communities. This might be driven by where and how you recognize your team. How do you let the teams create fun team bonding and ways in which you remind us that we're all human and build empathy and spaces for common interests? From a process perspective, we're so engineered for in-person and face-to-face -face conversations. How do you think about frameworks for detailed documentation and over communication? What tools are most productive for this? Structurally, this means moving away from the need to collaborate synchronously to asynchronously. And there's a lot of technology tools that make this really easy, like Loom, Envision, Miro. And it may not work for all work circumstances, but certainly for the majority of things that need to get done by your teams, these are some things to consider. All right, so shifting away from the organization to the topic of this panel, which is youth and how are they transitioning? With a captive community of about 80,000 in the Andala Learning Community and over 1,000 in the Andala Talent Network, we often poll and seek feedback on leading indicators for motivation, engagement, and productivity. And here are some insights. Certainly with the pandemic and going all remote, job security and fear of the unknown is driving a strong desire to keep growing and keep increasing their skills base. They're actively seeking opportunities to grow and we're also seeing an increase in using those skills and creating additional revenue streams. So yours may not be their only way of earning money. While also seeking job security, they are also really valuing and starting to demand some a level of independence that comes with being remote. They prefer optimal flexibility and autonomy with schedule and personal time management. Allow them to do their work. Don't dictate the when and how. We were quite surprised that even with this push towards independence, there's a strong sense of belonging within the networks that we've created. We've seen the natural formation of small teams that enhance this collective accountability and motivation. These have become less geographic based and more so about interests and opportunities. They are passionate about elevating their communities and certainly the next generation. They have a strong, strong sense of what it means to share knowledge, but also to build each other up. Um, sort of the sense of we are all better off if we are collectively sharing and learning together. There's still a lot to be done in developing the science behind remote communities, but I suspect we will learn more in this panel and in the near term as remote first matures into the necessary norm. Thank you for the opportunity to share Andela's experiences transitioning to remote first and certainly the impact it's had on the youth that we engage with. I really do hope to hear more about how you've applied remote first um, approaches um, and certainly to discuss more in our Q&A session. Thank you very much, Wambui, for that very um, introspective perspective on work integrated learning. Um, Sylvia, I'd like to uh, invite you to uh, take the lead on your, your discussion right now and um, please feel free to, uh, to go ahead. So good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, my experiences leading a remote internship project early this year um, when the COVID lockdown was at its peak and relate that to the work I'm currently doing at the MasterCard Foundation and the prospects of remote, remote work for the continent. So with the project that we undertook, it was basically um, a call to March students with employers who 
had had to lay off um, the workers who were being forced to go digital because everybody was under lockdown and everything was moving digitally. And on the other side, we also had students who had their internships being cancelled or their jobs being put on hold because organizations were struggling to keep up with COVID restrictions. And so a lot of recruitment decisions had been put on hold. So the intention was to find other pathways for students to gain the work experience or the first jobs that they needed once they were graduating from school. So on the demand side, employers needed them and on the supply side, students also you know, needed the opportunities. So it was easy to make that much. Now, the lessons we learned in um, facilitating this program, first on the employer side, which we're calling the demand side, is um, not, never to assume that because they are employers, they understand and know what to recruit for and how we could to recruit for the talent that they need. Um, why we say this is because um, we basically started out not knowing what to expect, right? But when the first call went out, there was a lot of interest from employers and a lot of them were SMEs and, you know, they elaborated the problems that they were having with, you know, personnel at the time, but did not know exactly how they could integrate someone remotely into their team and what exactly they could give to that remote person to work on. What aspects of their operations could be handled remotely. So on our team side, we had to do a lot of work with employers to help them figure that out, to draft job descriptions that they would be able to send out and attract people to um, apply for these roles. And so that work with employers to help them to understand what aspects of the operations could be done virtually really helped with getting the roles um, out there. And then another thing we learned with what we has also you know, mentioned is about onboarding and creating a sense of community. Um, in Andela's case, it, it's been a, a good experience because, well, it's always been in their plans. But for the SMEs that we dealt with, it had never been in their plans to go remote. And so onboarding interns or um, first time employees virtually was a big deal and you know people used all sort of you know systems like having a buddy system some informal check-in meetings to try and create that sense of community because you want the people working with you to feel belonged and then there was a problem of supervising interns virtually again there was there wasn't enough preparation on the employer's side to do that and having to adopt new technologies to be able to do that trello was one tool that a lot of people had to adopt to do this and what we realized that peer learning is important even amongst employers we always talk about peer learning with students but we quickly realized that with employers as well peer learning was very important on the student side our learnings were first the fact that young people they do not necessarily attach the same professionalism to virtual work as they do with in-person work. There's a feeling of, um, I am home, so I sometimes don't show up meetings dressed apart or um, come into meetings late. The, the, the level of professionalism we noted wasn't necessarily the same as when they were you know, doing in-person in internships or starting work in person. And one learning was also movement and access, having to work, the option to work from home provides opportunities for these young people to be able to do that. And then with refugees, you know, the various policies in the various countries of asylum that prevent them from entering the workforce. And so they are not able to access jobs in the countries that they are um, seeking asylum in. And so, you know, Breaking down barriers means that I could be a refugee living anywhere and be working anywhere on the continent or in any part of the world. And with women as well, um, you know, even when young women enter the workforce, sometimes for um, 
childbearing or other family emergencies, they sometimes would have to um, make that difficult choice to leave employment, to stay at home for a while, to be able to take care of um, whatever's happening in the family. And so remote work would be able to allow them to conveniently combine both if th that option is available. And so for us at the MasterCard Foundation, we see this as an opportunity. And so to the question whether young people are um, ready for virtual work opportunities, um, definitely they are. I mentioned earlier that they are digital natives, so it's not new. Um, but we also realize that there's some inter interventions that we need to put in place to allow young people fully benefit from remote work. And um, I'm just going to go through these interventions. First is education and skills building. Um, like I mentioned with the projects we had, the school we dealt with had a career services program that was very robust that had prepared students with employability skills. So they were work ready. It was just a matter of connecting them. So first of all, education needs to provide that. Education needs to not just provide a theory and a classroom knowledge, but the professional development as well. And so career services as part of education, especially in the secondary and tertiary levels, are important for us to be able to do this. Introducing digital skills into our curriculum is also very important. So in as much as young people are digitally, you know, savvy, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, being savvy on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn would translate into being able to do digital marketing. So these skills need to be intentionally inculcated in our curriculum so that students are understanding what digital marketing actually means, not just posting on Instagram. And we also need to have, you know, education that hones teamwork, communication, all the soft skills that I've earlier, you know, elaborated that were being required by the employees that hosted the interns and making sure that we're equipping our career services professional to do the work they need, they have to do. And on the policy side, um, when we mentioned it, internet connectivity in their homes should be fast, it should be reliable and data cost should be uh, you know as cheap as possible to allow young people access it to do the work that they need to do um access to computer like i mentioned it was one of the enablers in the project that we run um we need policies that facilitate acquisition that make it easy for young people to have them or we need to have you know avenues where it's easy for young people to access a computer somewhere in their community if they don't have it personally and then in terms of systems, um, we may need to have community co-working spaces. Like I mentioned, um, if you have a young person in a place where space and privacy is an issue, they won't be efficient working from home and they won't be efficient in any kind of virtual or remote work experience. So we need to start thinking around creating spaces in communities where young people can go to and share a, a you know work in space and then we need to have better ways of connecting the young people to virtual opportunities is one thing creating the opportunities is another thing making it accessible and visible to young people to access them and then on the employer's side there's you know the need for collaboration with education because i mean education was trying to now catch up with preparing young people for physical work and overnight they now have to deal with preparing young people for remote work. So there's a need for collaboration and sharing of ideas and training the young people together so that they graduate with the skills that employers are looking for. And then, you know, we can't expect to train somebody with physical internships and expect them to graduate into a virtual work environment and be able to thrive from the get-go. So employers would need to start providing virtual internships so that students who will be graduating would already have that experience whilst they were in school. And very importantly, we need policies at workplaces that pay stipends to interns. There are a lot of unpaid stipends on the continent. And a lot of times it's assumed that, you know, when you're working virtually, we've given you data, so you shouldn't need anything. But rather, you know, if a student is from a background where they use their vacation period to fend for themselves and make, make an income to pay for their bills and to feed themselves. 
working for you means they may not be able to de do these other gigs that they usually involve themselves in. And so without that stipend, it makes it difficult for a young person to even take up a remote internship, even though they don't physically have to commute and incur transportation costs. And then um, we need structures in the workplaces when we has, uh, you know, alluded to this, that facilitate remote work that allow young people to develop professionally, to create networks. That's how we're going to attract young people to want to work remotely in um, an organization or in a working environment. And also we need to think about inclusion and equity with the um, populations that I already mentioned for persons with disabilities, for refugees, for young women, um, remote of, work allows us that opportunity to do inclusion and diversity in our workplaces in a very easy way and so we need to start thinking of policies that allow us to be very diverse and inclusionary and in, in recruitment and in the kind of roles that we make available so thank you thank you very much sylvia for your presentation um, i really like the whole point of um, inclusion and, and openness and and seeing COVID as, a, as an opportunity to uh, move the innovation needle forward on, on work integrated learning. Uh, with that said, uh, Judine, you, you have the table. Please, uh, please feel free to go ahead. Great. Thanks, Peter. I will. So thank you very much um, for inviting me to be part of today's session. I've learned a great deal already. It's um, it's inspiring to hear about the work that that's happening. Um, so before I get into um, sharing some of the research that we've done, I thought it would be useful for me to share a little bit about the context in which this research is being done. So the University of Waterloo is a research intensive university. It's located about an hour west of Toronto in Canada. Um, our university was founded in 1957 and one of the defining features was the creation of a co-op education program, uh, the first of its kind in, in Canada. Um, and one of the things that we're best known for we have about 23,000 undergraduate students. That's about 70% of our undergraduate population that participates in co-op programs. And that involves them typically alternating between four months of study and in courses and four months in paid full-time um, work terms. And so over the course of their undergraduate degree, our co-op students complete between four and six of these four month work terms. In order to support the program, we have a global network of employers, um, about over 7,000 of them in companies um, around the globe. And lastly, we are the home of the Work Learn Institute. So with so much of our brand uh, associated with co-op, it's in our best interest to study and continue to advance it. And so the Work Learn Institute is a, a research institute focused on conducting research on co-op and other forms of work integrated learning and to really understand the impact of those practices for students and for the host organizations and employers. I'm going to talk um, briefly today about three studies that we've done. Of course, if you're interested in hearing more, I'll be happy to share um, links to materials that we have. We are in the midst right now of a study um, with our fall, so September to December work terms. Um, we're, we're investigating uh, the remote work onboarding um, strategies that employers have used. And so while this research is still underway, I can share some preliminary um, results with you. So we've done this study, about 700 students responded to a survey we asked, of, of the things we asked them, one of the things we asked them about was the type of onboarding activities that they participated in. These are all students who uh, participated in fully remote work terms this, this fall. Um, and this is, this is what we heard from them. So they, they grouped the activities into, we've grouped the activities into four categories according to what they shared with us. The first, they talked about welcome messages they received. Those may have been an email, a letter, a phone call, a Zoom call with a manager or senior leader within the organization, or it may have been a public announcement uh, made by the company. A number of other onboarding activities 
included uh, scheduled meetings. So the topics for those meetings might have been um, introductions, uh, goal setting with the students, as well as training for specific tasks. Students were also often involved in introductory sessions. And so those may have been company-wide orientation sessions or se sessions scheduled with specific team members, HR or senior leaders within the companies. And lastly, students indicated a number of resources that were given to them to get them started. And those included things like contact information lists, um, introductory schedule or work plan to help the student get started. Uh, and sometimes it included a co-op student manual or a website that they could consult for additional information. When we did look at the um, onboarding tactics used, we examined it. Uh, one of the first ways that we've examined it is by looking at the size of the organization. So from a small, very small organization, one to 10 people, um, all the way up to organizations that had more than a thousand people. And we did notice that there were some commonalities in terms of the tactics used. So it was fairly common for students to receive a welcome me message from their manager and for their manager to set aside a block of time to meet with the student. Um, this is similar to what we would see in a, in a face to face um, experience for students. Uh, one of the things that we've heard in past research from managers is that investing time at the front end of the work term really pays dividends. And one of the initiatives that we have running currently is an e-learning um, initiative where we are trying to get universities on the continent to be able to build robust structures to support e-learning for students. Um, and we, 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 we recognize that this is something that will not go away, even post-COVID, because um, we all see the benefits of, you know, e-learning and providing access and, you know, allowing flexibility when it comes to um, the work and the studies that young people have to do. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we are doing as a foundation to ensure that we do not go back to business as usual when, when this pandemic is over. And on, on the other side, with our Young Africa Work strategy, um, digitization and innovation is one of the core pillars that we have across all our country programs. And so we have digital teams that are working across industries and across sectors to digitalize some of the processes that we currently have and see how, you know, um, moving digital will provide more opportunities for young people but also be able to advance the work that organizations are doing and probably bring in more efficiency and profitability to industry thank you very much sylvia um anyone else any other thoughts uh, on that uh, on that concept yeah if i can i think one of the things that we've learned through the andala learning community is this notion of while access is very important, and I think um, Sylvia has spoken to this, it's the way of learning. Um, and so it's, it's a, the, the work in practice um, sort of creates a sense of agility, but also learning with sort of smaller cohorts of like learning groups, and it doesn't really matter where they are. And so I think there's a bit of disruption about the, the notion of how we work and how we practice um, that I think becomes really the way forward and, and, and not going back to waiting for super structured um, ways of learning and, and, it's, and, it, and it has to evolve. Um, so that's one of the areas that I think we've seen in, in terms of the future. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Judine, any thoughts? Yeah, a, a couple of things. So I think from a, an educational institution perspective that, um, that there's no doubt the changes that, that are, have been underway will, will be maintained in some, some way, shape or form. I, we have um, employed 300 co-op students on campus as senior and, and online learning assistants, and they've been deployed out uh, to the faculty since May working with professors to help them create course materials um, that they can then they can use in their remote classes and I think that's been incredibly beneficial on a few fronts it's given professors sort of a um, a frontline view to the student side of things but at the same time it's giving the students the idea of what it's like to, to mount and run 
uh, an online course. And so I think that's been a really effective strategy. And in doing that, I think that's going to have long term impacts for how we present and engage, um, present content and engage with students in courses. I think on the uh, the work integrated learning side, I think um, this will become yet another way that employers can engage with students. Um, I know that for, for some Waterloo students, the downside of this alternating four months work, four months school is needing to move every four months. And so um, remote work has the, has the benefit of enabling them to, to stay put. Um, and so I think there's no doubt that some students are going to see the um, the amazing work, as, as Wambui mentioned, that organizations are doing, not just to um, adapt and replicate, but really to, to change the nature of work. And I, I think these students are going to be ready for that. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Judine. Um, I'd also like to touch upon the theme of hybridity. We, we've been hearing a lot of this, uh, you know, in our daily work, as, as well as in the literature, um, you know, once the world goes back to quote unquote new normal how do your organizations see uh this hybrid model manifesting itself in um a day-to-day -day work basis um do you see part of your workforce staying at home or staying remotely do you see uh, a mix of the two how how was this this model of hybridity manifest itself in in, in your vision uh, or in your organization's terms um, please feel free to, to, to go ahead. Well, certainly as an organization, and Dallas' plan is to be remote first, um, but that does not mean that we will never, ever meet in person. Um, and so there is an expectation that we would make, and I think um, Sylvia alluded to this earlier, this notion of some co-working spaces, because sometimes with all safety precautions, um, taken into consideration, people do want to hang out together. We also, prior to the pandemic, saw greater correlation for our customers when our engineers were able to travel and be with them for a couple of weeks early on in the onboarding process. So I think those things are still important, and I think that that's probably where there will be some sense of in-person, um, but certainly really pushing to see how can we get remote to be the primary way of working or the way of engaging um, and then certainly the in-person as being the complement to it as opposed to vice versa. I, I was just going to say that um, one of the things that has struck me um, in, in different companies I've, I've heard from is um, that right now many of us are experiencing remote work for the first time through the lens of a pandemic and that remote work is is different than that when we're not constrained by a pandemic and i think that will be the next thing that we um that we all um those of us who are new to remote work will discover uh over the next year hopefully um is that is the flexibility that it does enable people and and yet at the same time that the as Rambui said the the ability to still get in 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 person um, sometimes, so the hybrid model. Sylvia, any perspectives from the MasterCard Foundation? Um, not very different from what has been shared. Um, we also foresee, you know, having that kind of hybrid model um, where the office is going to be one of the other places from where you can work, you know, and so not necessarily having a designated working spot that you, you have to be in. So I think that's where we are also moving. Yeah. Terrific. Um, I'd like to uh, open the floor to a few questions that have been asked by um, some of our participants. Yeah. Um, one of our colleagues from uh, AIM Senegal is asking, how can employers evaluate the performance of an employee who is working remotely? So in terms of monitoring and evaluation, what sort of tactics uh, have uh, your organizations been implementing uh, since COVID? Well, I think, I mean, Andala being an engineering organization, there are many tools, at least for our engineers, that allow us to evaluate um, productivity. Um, and so in engineering terms, we'll look at things like the velocity, the quality. Um, but I think for all roles, to be honest, it's really in how are you describing the outcome and um, and the sense of what the quality, what it could look like. Um, and then the timing of it. And then how are you creating the structures because things are agile and constantly moving that allow you to understand when those outcomes might change. And then how do you evaluate um, 
hopefully in sprints or in shorter cycles, um, how one is doing. And so I, I think it's an important question, um, Cedric, in that I think it is important for the success of remote first organizations to make sure that expectations are always upfront. Mm -hmm. Right, fantastic. Any other thoughts? Okay, moving right along. Um, we also have a question from one of our colleagues from uh, Ames, uh, Cameroon. Uh, a colleague is asking f uh, a question regarding to the organizational strategies of countries who don't have access to high-speed internet or low connectivity internet. What sort of uh, approaches uh, have you taken to mitigate those challenges? So again, low speed internet or those who have uh, low connectivity, have there been any, 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 work, any work done in that area? So, um, unfortunately, because the business of Mandela, and I'm oh, sorry, I, I feel like I'm speaking a lot, um, does involve being connected. Um, so we have not solved for it. Um, through the Andala Learning Community, what we have been able to do is through the partnerships is find ways to uh, allow the stipends that allow for um, some sort of better bundles, but where the infrastructure doesn't exist, I, I don't have mm -hmm. the solutions. I know for some of our engineers in countries where um, reliability has been a problem, we will always then look to see are there partners where co-working spaces that might have the infrastructure that can support an individual um, as opposed to us having to invest in, in, in an office. But um, Sylvia, I'd imagine you've seen a lot more of these. I'm trying to recollect, recall some of them, but I think what comes readily comes to mind is I remember with the remote internship project was um, advising um, students and employers to, you know, for people who had th this constraint, you know, to have periods gauge the periods when connectivity was, you know, good. And for some people, this was like midnight or in the wee hours of the morning where there are a lot less people online. And so working offline the whole day, if it's possible, or, you know, having a, a way to download your work and be able to work on it online. And then when you do come online, be able to, you know, send your emails or everything that needs to go out during that time. But in all of this, there's a need for communication. There's a need for understanding. People need to empathize with other people's situation for this to work. Terrific. So thank you very much uh, to our panelists and to our um, to our to our speakers. Um, I to wrap up by um, thanking you all once again for your very innovative work in uh, work integrated learning in some very challenging times. Uh, we look forward to um, learning more about uh, your your work and uh, some of the uh, innovative uh, aspects that you've taken to to mitigate disruptive change. Uh, likewise, please feel free to to keep in touch. Um, hopefully, we'll have a, a whole series of uh, of links uh, available uh, following the 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 NEF the the, the next Einstein forum. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank you once again for, for speaking today, and I, I look forward to being in touch in the near future. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye.